All right, so we're looking at Zephaniah this morning, so if you want to be making your way there, that will help. Uh, might be a little hard to find, unless you've been with us in the Minor Prophet series and, and you're familiar with where these books are at, the end of, of the Old Testament. So, um, I wonder if you're like me. Imagine I'm not the only one. Have you ever had a song totally change your mood? And I guess it could maybe be for, you know, like a bad effect if it had, you know, um, associations with some bad or sad time in your, of your life. But most of the time when we hear a song and it changes our mood, it's probably for the better. And I'm sure you've had this happen where it's just totally changed how you're feeling, how you're doing, lift you from being down in the dumps, pull you up and out of a downward spiral, or maybe you were dull spiritually, feeling kind of lifeless, and a song that you heard just breathed life into you. Maybe a song has awakened longings that you hadn't felt in a while, and you were just freshly motivated and encouraged. You kind of came alive, and you felt Again, especially things that really matter, God and his glory and his kingdom and all of that. Maybe it brought you to tears. So I've been listening, at least a fair amount for me, um, lately to Shane and Shane. I um, encourage you to look them up later if you've never heard um, the, these two guys. They're brothers. Wait, are they brothers? No, they're not brothers. Can't be because Shane and Shane. I don't know who they are. Anyway, they're good. Look them up. They wouldn't have the same name if they're brothers. They look like they're brothers. Okay, I'd recommend them. And there's a Psalms album, volume two, Psalm 46, Lord of Hosts, Psalm 34, Taste and See, Psalm 45, Fairest of All. And I highly recommend that you listen to these on 11, you know? Anybody get that reference? Okay, anyway, this one goes to 11. Um, so, yeah, turn it up and enjoy it. So it's amazing that just hearing a song, especially one with powerful lyrics that are matched to music that kind of appropriately, powerfully carries those lyrics down into your soul, it can change everything for you. Well, keep that in mind as we take a look at Zephaniah, and I think you'll see why by the time we're done. So we're continuing through the series on the Minor Prophets. Um, they're minor not because they're unimportant or of lesser importance. They're just shorter, okay? They're shorter than the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, okay? So there's an outline. If you have the, the sheet pulled up, the notes on your electronic device, or you'll see the, the points on the slide, the slides behind me here. So first point, where are we? We need to get a little bit of orientation because maybe you haven't spent a lot of time in the book of Zephaniah. This is not heavily trafficked territory in the Bible, so we need to get our bearings a little bit here, right? So look at Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 1. This is kind of the introduction, um, giving you a sense of where we're at in history. So the word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah the son of Ammon, king of Judah. Judah, southern kingdom. Josiah, oh, okay. So if you read, and I would encourage you to do this, I did it yesterday and was like really encouraged, and 2 Kings 22 and 23, you can look it up later, just write it down. It's background to what's going on here. I'll give you a little thumbnail sketch. So Josiah became king after his grandfather, Manasseh was king for 55 years in Judah. And it was a wicked, wicked reign. So this is supposed to be the people of God. And this guy was just, I mean, he, he caused idolatry with a capital I to proliferate in Judah for all these years. Just did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. His son Ammon reigned for two years after he died, but that's it. His servants conspired against him and killed him. So then Ammon's son Josiah, which would be 
Manasseh's grandson, was made king in his father's place at the ripe old age of eight. (laughs) Ben is eight, at least until next Monday. Um, So, yeah, it's pretty young to be king, right? So he reigned for 31 years from 640 B.C. to 609 B.C. And in his 18th year as king, As a result of commissioning the repair of the temple, the book of the law was found. Can you imagine? These are the people of God, and they lost the Bible. Like, they were completely not doing their worship according to God's word. It was just gone. I mean, can you imagine what had to happen for the the word of God to just be completely lost? So it was found... And they had been, think about this, wickedly rebellious as a people. You know, syncretism, maybe worshiping Yahweh, but also these other gods kind of hedging their bets, you know. It's just like um, syncretism, polytheism. Is just, they were just like the nations. So it's not surprising that for the first 18 years of Josiah's reign, he wasn't particularly dedicated to Yahweh. It was how he grew up. is kind of the air that he breathed. But when the book of the law was found and it was read to him, By God's grace, he had this spiritual sensitivity and he tore his clothes. He realized how guilty they were, how God's wrath was pent up against them for all of their wickedness and idolatry. It's like the light turned on, like the scales were taken away from his eyes. And then he embarked on this extensive and even inspiring series of reforms. 2 Kings 23, you can read it later. He had all the elders come together, hear the word of the law. He made a covenant with Yahweh. He removed all the idolatrous images from the temple. There were images to Baal and Asherah. You know, they're in the temple. That's supposed to be God's house, right? And he burned them, and he deposed the priests who were ordained to make sacrifices to these false gods on the high places. He broke down the houses of male cult prostitution. He defiled those high places and their altars, broke them up. He restored the Passover. It says that they hadn't kept the Passover since the days of the judges. So this is really wonderful and inspiring reform, and yet... 2 Kings 23, 26 says this, Still, the Lord did not turn from the burning of his great wrath by which his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight as I have removed Israel, because the northern kingdom had already been destroyed by Assyria in 722. And I will cast off this city that I have chosen, Jerusalem, and the house of which I said, my name shall be there. The reforms didn't go deep enough. Josiah was changed, and maybe some people, you know, got on board, but still there were, there was idolatry of heart just still rampant among the people, and God was going to judge them. And eventually he did, 586, Babylonians came and wiped out Jerusalem. So Zephaniah's ministry, remember point number one, where are we? (laughs) Zephaniah's ministry most likely took place before those reforms, maybe catalyzing some of those reforms, and maybe during those reforms, okay? So probably 630s, 620s. And he's speaking in the midst of a time of terrible moral decline as a result of Manasseh's reign, So whether it was before the reforms or after the reforms, you know, because idolatry among the people dies hard, right? The bottom line is most of Zephaniah is about judgment. Great. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? Um, Well, don't worry. It's not just about judgment. And you know what? We need to hear about the judgment too. Okay? So point number two, judgment and the day of the Lord or day of Yahweh. So look at chapter 1, verses 2 to 18, okay? And I'll make a few comments as we go along um, under point number 2. So the word of the Lord comes, and here's the word of the Lord to these people, supposed supposed to be his people. And he says, I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth. Whoa, that's a shocking message. I mean, what does that sound like? 
That sounds like a second flood. The flood is judgment. So this is in no uncertain terms. Judgment is coming. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off rubble, probably referring to the idols and the images, just trash. That's all they are. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal, this false god, the fertility god, the storm god, and the name of the idolatrous priests, along with the priests, those who bow down on the roofs to the host of the heavens. You see, these are, this is inside Judah, the people of God. This is Jerusalem, and they're worshiping all these false gods. Those who bow down and swear to Yahweh, to the Lord, and yet swear by Milcom, the God of the Ammonites. So this is just like polytheistic kind of lip service. Let's just make sure we keep all the gods happy because they really didn't believe like they should. They didn't really believe in the Lord like they should. Those who have turned back from following the Lord who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. That's their true heart. They've turned away from God. They don't seek him. So verse 7, be silent before the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is near. The day of Yahweh is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. That is most likely a very sobering euphemism. The guilty in Jerusalem. The fire is coming. They are the guests consecrated, set apart for fire, for judgment. And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. Again, they wanted to be like the nations. And so they, they made these ungodly alliances. They wanted to be too much like the world. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold. You remember 1 Samuel 5 when the Ark of the Covenant was taken to the Philistines and put in the temple of Dagon, their god, and in the morning, what happened to Dagon? He's fallen over. They set him back up. He falls over again. His head, you know, falls off and his arms fall off. You know, some god, you know, that is. And so because of how the thing had laid, they, they would step over the threshold. It was kind of this superstitious thing. So pagan superstition is, is happening among the people of God. And God is saying, away with all this superstition. I am the living God. I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold, those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. So there's all kinds of wickedness and lack of integrity and abuse and violence and, and all of that happening in Israel. On that day, declares Yahweh, declares the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate, kind of the main gate to the north, a wail from the second quarter, a loud crash from the hills. It's coming from everywhere. Totality of destruction, all points, you know, around the city, there's trouble. And then verse 12 is chilling. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps. And I will punish the men who are complacent. Okay, that word is a word that refers to um, wine that's left on the lees too long. And so the dregs just ruin the wine and it gets bitter and it starts to coagulate. Okay, and it just gets like jelly mess. So because they're not responsive, because they're just sitting there, in relation to God, they are complacent. He is going to judge them. And he's going to search Jerusalem. There is nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. So do you see that actually their complacency came from this belief that God was complacent? Ah, he's not going to do anything. Doesn't do anything good. What have you done for me lately? I mean, we're fine. We're still breathing. 
Well, his patience is to lead us to repentance. It's not evidence of his indifference, you know, that he is complacent and isn't going to do anything. So their goods shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. It's enough to bring, you know, a Navy SEAL to his knees. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust. So that which is valuable treated as just nothing and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord. In the fire of his jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. For a full and sudden end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. So a sobering picture of judgment that's coming on Judah, right? And it's because of their idolatry. So Deuteronomy 6, 14 and 15 said, you shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you, which is exactly what they did do, which is why those, you know, God's idols were in the temple. Josiah had to carry out and smash and get rid of. For the Lord your God is in your midst as a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. So don't go after other gods, being like the nations. Otherwise, he'll judge you just like this. And because of it, that's exactly what God's going to do. That's what he's warning of in chapter 1. So the day of Yahweh, the day of the Lord, what is that? Because you see it, a day, a day, a day, a day. Like it's just this day, on that day, on that day, at that time, the great day of the Lord, referenced over and over and over again. What is that? It's supposed to be, it was expected to be judgment on God's enemies, blessing and deliverance for his people. Okay, so the people of God should look forward to that day, right? But his people were more like the nations than like his people. So that's why this is a day of warning to Jerusalem and Judah at the time. Again, God's not going to be complacent with the complacent. So I don't know if there's anybody here in this room or on the live stream that is in that kind of dangerous place of complacence, complacency. I mean, do any of you feel like, you know what, God, I don't know. He just doesn't seem to do anything, at least not for me. I don't see any good. You know, come on, God, can't you throw me a bone? Like, a little help here. Don't you know what I'm going through? Don't you see what I'm going through? Don't you care? Don't you even hear me? Like, why don't you do something? Have you ever accused him of doing nothing? I mean, how many of us feel like, you know, my life hasn't exactly turned out as I'd hoped? We can harbor hard thoughts of God. And we can keep singing the songs, but actually underneath is this kind of like corrosive thing that God is kind of like a do-nothing God. I mean, I've asked. I'm just kind of tired of asking. You see how dangerous that is? God is not a do-nothing God. Look at all of his promised judging action here and it's like smelling salts to the complacent wake up if he isn't coming in judgment it's because his patience is intended to lead you to repentance because he wants to bless you instead of judge you so he is not apathetic or indifferent or inactive and then we're going to see in chapter 3 not only is he active in judgment where he must but he is so active with compassion and love and grace and mercy. And we'll get to that soon. So here, though, this is supposed to be cold water to the face, to the complacent, to, to 
those, you know, bowing down to idols, other gods before God. Otherwise, the day of the Lord will be terrible. It was going to be for Judah, and they claimed, they called themselves the people of God. So Paul House, uh, Old Testament scholar, he wrote, judgment will be as pervasive as the idolatry in Judah. But the day of the Lord isn't just a day of judgment for Judah. It's also a day of judgment for all the nations, okay? Yahweh is not just kind of a local tribal deity. He is the creator of heaven and earth. He's the Lord of all the nations. So his judgment is also going to extend to his enemies, to the wicked in every nation. So look down at 2.4. Gaza shall be deserted, and Ashkelon shall be, become a desolation. Ashdod's people shall be driven out at noon, and Ekron shall be uprooted. Woe to you, inhabitants of the seacoast, you nation of the Cherethites. The word of the Lord is against you. O Canaan, land of the Philistines, and I will destroy you until no inhabitant until, destroy you until no inhabitant is left. And then verse 8, he talks about Moab and Ammon. So basically, if you knew your ancient Near Eastern map, the Philistines are on the west. Okay? And then in verses 8 to 11, he talks about Moab and Ammon. That's the east. Okay? Moab and Ammon, they're going to become like Sodom and Gomorrah. See verse 9? This is going to be their lot in return for their pride. Verse 10, because they taunted and boasted against the people of the Lord of hosts, the Lord will be awesome against them. Certainly not complacent. This is not a do-nothing God. For he will famish all the gods of the earth. You know what people did to, to worship gods back then? What did they do? They fed their gods. You know, they put out this little offering. You know, I mean, that's what sacrifices are for, right? To feed the gods, to get on the gods' good side so that they bless you. And if you really have trouble, if you really need to get the God's attention, in some cases, like with Moloch, you would sacrifice a, a human, like your child, human sacrifice, to really get the God's attention so that they bless you. And the Lord is saying, no more meals for the false gods. I'm going to starve them. <laughs> you see, because I'm just going to get rid of all this idolatry. I'm going to judge it. And then in verse 12, Ethiopia the Cushites, that's the south. So we've got the west, the east, the south, and then verses 13 to 15, Assyria. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. That exultant city, Nineveh, that lives securely, that said in her heart, I am, and there's no one else. It's going to bring them down too. That's the north. So all points on the compass are covered here. Every nation, the thoroughness of, of God's judgment in the day of the Lord is the focus. And then, chapter 3, verses 1 to 8, it goes, the focus goes back to Jerusalem. Okay? So, woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city. Should that be the description of the people of God, the city of God? Rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city? She listens to no voice? You know, God speaks through his prophets, and they stick their fingers in their ears, and they want to, you know, kill the prophets. Shut them up at least. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Her officials within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave nothing till the morning. Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests profane what is holy. They do violence to the law. The Lord within her is righteous. So, Sadly, the leaders were unrighteous. They were feeding themselves on the people rather than feeding the people. They were doing injustice rather than cultivating and protecting and promoting righteousness. So the Lord within her is righteous. He does know injustice. And he's going to set things right. So, down in verse 8, Therefore, wait for me declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger. For in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. So, guilty 
Israelites are not going to escape. They're not immune. They don't have spiritual kind of diplomatic immunity from the wrath of God. In the face of all their wicked idolatry and injustice, And so in the fire of his jealousy, all the earth will be consumed because God is a consuming fire. The significant theme in the Bible. I was surprised to see how many references to this. Deuteronomy 4.24, the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Deuteronomy 9.3, know therefore today that he who goes over before you as a consuming fire is the Lord your God. He will destroy them and subdue them before you so you shall drive them out and make them perish quickly as the Lord has promised. So if he is for you, then his fire, his strength, goes before you to clear the way. But if you are his enemy, it's a consuming fire against you. So the day of the Lord is the end of all evil. It's the day that God deals with the evil and washes the world clean. So we should look forward to that day, right? Can't wait till the world gets totally washed clean, deals with all the evil. Well, what about the evil in here? There's all that evil out there, but evil runs right through here, and it runs out of here, out of our hearts, right? We are in trouble. So if we are idolaters, idolaters Calvin said our hearts are like idol factories, You know, we're sinful. We are in trouble. Where can you hide? Well, look back at chapter 2, verse 1. Who can escape this consuming fire? Where can you hide? Well, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Gather together. Yes, gather, O shameless nation, which is Israel, before the decree takes effect. Before the day passes away like chaff, before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord, seek the Lord, seek Yahweh, all you humble of the land, you who do his just commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. So this is something to give all your attention to. This is not like, you know, one of many things. It's not multitask. And one of the things is, you know, in the background, we'll have, yeah, 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 the Lord. This is not yawning kind of token attention to the Lord. This is not one among many many things vying for our attention. This is the first and the greatest thing. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. He is your only hope. Your gods can't save you. Your idols can't save you. Your money can't save you. So seek Yahweh while he may be found, like Mike read in Isaiah 55. Repentance and humility and seeking the Lord is the only way to avert the disaster of the day of the Lord, the wrath of God. So who emerges from the fire? It's the humble God-seekers. And it's not just the humble God-seekers from Israel, but from all the nations. So again, Paul House, um, Old Testament professor, said this. He says, just as the wicked in Israel are treated like the wicked Gentiles, so the righteous among the Gentiles, those who worship the Lord, are equated with the Israelite remnant. So this is not just hope for the nation of Israel, it's hope ultimately for all the nations. You know what Zephaniah's name means? It means Yahweh has hidden or protected. Yahweh has protected. So do you see how this starts to point to Jesus? Yahweh has provided a refuge from the storm of his righteous anger. Look in chapter 3, verse 12. But I will leave in your midst, sounds like chapter 2, verse 3, I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. So 
So, after the day of, of the Lord, this is the kind of people who will populate the city of God. Those who seek refuge in the name of the Lord, those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall they be found in nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue, for they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid, because the Lord is their shepherd. Okay? So, has the day of the Lord happened yet? Okay, that's, that's like a really big question here. Like, when does this happen? Has it happened already? Is it happening in the future? You know, like, Wait a second, you said it's the day when God deals completely, like the end of all evil, washing the world clean. That hasn't happened yet. Well, there's actually been lots of days of the Lord in history, like bringing Israel out of Egypt. That was the day of the Lord because he redeemed his people and he judged his enemies, right? So there's lots of days like that. But there is the day of the Lord, like the final day of the Lord that's coming. And all those other ones have just been like foreshadowings, just early examples of the pattern, creating the pattern. So the day of the Lord, has it happened yet? Well, yes and no. <laughs> so our last two points are the day of the Lord has been inaugurated, but it's not yet consummated. Okay? And here's where we put Zephaniah in the context of the whole Bible. Okay? And find its place in the big story. So look at chapter 3 now, verses 9 to 20. And here's where things get pretty sweet. So, verse 8, remember, the fire in my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. So our God is a consuming fire. Like, that's sobering. But then there's this hopeful turn. Look at verse 9, chapter 3, verse 9. For at that time, again, it's the day of the Lord, I will change the speech of the peoples, not just my people, but all the nations, to a pure speech. Huh. It almost sounds like a reversal of Babel. Where they wanted to organize life around themselves and their own selfish, prideful purposes and their own glory. And so God judged them and, you know, they couldn't understand each other. But what would the reversal of that look like? Pure speech organized around God at the center and his glory. So at that time, it will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. So not serving their own selfish purposes to build their city to the sky for their glory, but Worshiping God and serving Him together, united as one people. One people from all the peoples. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers. The so these are, you know, Ethiopians coming as worshipers of Yahweh. The daughter of my dispersed ones shall bring my offering. On that day, again, we're talking about the day of the Lord. You shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. So there's going to be actually hope of forgiveness and reconciliation for rebels like you and me. For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. But I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. Remember who was in the midst? It was these, you know, Leaders who were feeding themselves on the people and doing injustice. But I will leave after I purify this people, after I judge and my consuming fire comes through. I will leave in your midst the people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Those who are left in Israel shall do no injustice and speak no lies. They're going to be purified. They're going to be new. So, verse 14, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel, rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He's cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. So do you see? This is pointing to Jesus. Yahweh, the living God, 
in our midst when Jesus came, Emmanuel, God with us. So the day of the Lord is the day that Yahweh visits. He shows up and he deals decisively with evil and enemies and delivers his people, sets everything to rights, ushering in peace and human flourishing and the renewal of all creation. Well, that's not fully consummated, but it certainly has begun in Christ. So why in the world can we sing and shout and rejoice because in Christ the Lord has taken away the judgments against us. He's cleared away our enemies. He's conquered death and Satan and the grave. Way bigger enemies than the Babylonians or the Assyrians or whoever. King of Israel, the Lord, he's in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. So there's still evil in this world and there's plenty of cause to fear But ultimately, the Lord is now our shepherd. And with him as our shepherd, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't have to fear any evil because he's with us. So do you see how it's begun? The day of the Lord is already begun. And it began at the cross. Because, you know what God did at the cross? He poured out his wrath not on us rebels. He poured out his wrath on Jesus in our place so that we could be forgiven and redeemed. So Yahweh's in our midst, the incarnation. He lived the life we failed. He's the second Adam. He's the true Israel. He died the death we deserve to die. He bore the cup of God. He drank the cup of God's wrath that we deserve to drink. Judgment fell on him. He was consumed by the consuming fire. And so for those who take refuge in him, trust in him, Jesus is our shelter, our dwelling place, our refuge from the storm of God's wrath. We've been rescued from the wrath to come. We don't have to fear it anymore. We've got nothing left to fear. Jesus was shattered on the cross so that we could be sheltered from the coming storm of God's wrath. So we sing. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart because of the gospel. So John Calvin said it well. I've quoted this some years ago. I love this thing. The church is the place where the gospel is preached. Gospel is good news. Good news makes people happy. Happy people sing. But then, too, unhappy people may sing to cheer themselves up. A song can change your day, your week, your month. Your, just totally change how you're doing. And I love this quote by Ray Ortland Jr. As we savor the good news of the sin-bearing servant of the Lord, the mountains of frost and ice within begin to thaw and we learn to enthuse. The gospel of a surprising salvation can only make us laugh, sing, and cheer. Every church should put a notice on its front door. All face-saving moralists take warning. Within these doors, your chilly pride is in danger of melting into exuberant joy. Enter at your own risk. But all sinners depressed with guilt are welcome. Come, come to the waters. Come buy and eat. You don't need any money. It's all free. It's a gift of grace. The test of a church's faith is not only the wording in its creed, but also the gladness of its worship. The gospel demands a carefree spirit. If we aren't going to hell anymore, if we stand to inherit every blessing Almighty God can think of, if nothing can stand in the way of our restored humanness because it's all ours through the merit of Christ, the friend of sinners, if that can't make us smile, what can? So the song of the redeemed, sing aloud, church. Shout, rejoice, and exult with all your heart. Turn it up to 11 this afternoon. Because the Lord's in our midst. Jesus came to save, and then he gave us his spirit so that he's with us all the way to the end. But that's not the only song in the book of Zephaniah. So yes, the song of the redeemed is huge. Sing aloud, shout, rejoice, and exult. God himself is singing in the book of Zephaniah. Okay, so buckle up your seatbelt. This is awesome. If this can't warm your heart, like, 
you, you need to go for some spiritual paddles, you know, on the chest, like, boom, boom, you know, like, wake up. So it's not just the song of the redeemed, it's the song of the redeemer. Zephaniah shows us that God is a loving, a passionately loving father. He's also an artist and a poet and a lover and a singer. It's the song of the redeemer. You remember Hebrews 12, 2? Why did Jesus go all the way to the cross, enduring the shame, despising the shame, for the joy set before him? <laughs> Again, you remember how I started out, how a song can change how you're doing, can change everything? Why do you think in Luke 15, the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost sons, why do you think it says that there's more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than 99 righteous persons who need no repentance? Do you think that God kind of sits back and he's, you know, impassable and, you know, just not emotional and kind of stoic and aloof and whatever, but the angels, you know, they're, they're kind of excitable, you know, so it's just the angels get a little excited. You know, they're okay. Just relax. They'll, they'll come down off the... Where do you think that's, that song, that party begins? It begins with God. The joy is God's. The angels share it and declare it and enjoy it and sing it. So if you don't believe me, <laughs> you need to read your Bible more. Okay? Like, do you really believe this? I think that our default setting, even as Christians, is that God barely puts up with me. I know that's probably where I land, even if I don't use those words consciously. Like, he's got to be sick and tired of me by now. Read the Bible, folks. Read Zephaniah. Read Luke 15. Read Isaiah 62, 4 to 5. Listen to this. You shall no more be termed forsaken. Your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called, my delight is in her. And your land shall be called married. So the people of God, after the purging work of judgment for the sake of restoration, calls his people, that's my delight in her. Like, that's how I relate to my people, my bride, my delight is in her delight. Do you, I mean, do you believe that God delights in you as a Christian? He doesn't just love you like in a, I've got to love, you know. There, there, there's like affection and, could we say it? He likes you? My delight is in her. For the Lord delights in you. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. I resist that. I don't know about you. Do you, do you resist that at all? I, ooh, just, or maybe I could, I could encourage somebody else with that, but have a hard time believing it for myself. So I remember doing this wedding in Vermont years ago. And this is probably when this, these thoughts, like actually seeing that the Bible talks like this, that God talks this way about how he relates to his people. And so I'm doing this wedding. It was this cool New England chapel. And like, you know, the seats go back and then literally there's really nothing except the outside doors. This church is probably 250 years old or something. And um, so, the, you know, the wedding party's up here and the trumpet sounds, which was kind of cool trumpet sounds and then the bride the doors open and it was this beautiful day the sun comes in the bride is like radiant you know and I'm standing like this and the, the groom is right here and he was a friend I knew him and he just starts bouncing on his toes like and so I'm looking here and I just about lost it because I think actually there was something that happened at the at the rehearsal the night before where one of the songs was striking some of these themes and so I was thinking of that as well and I thought could Jesus feel that way about his bride? Like, I don't believe that. But I think I should believe that. And then I remember reading Philippians 1 where Paul says to the Philippians, 
I yearn for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Jesus has affection for his people, for his bride. So, there is the song of the redeemed, brothers and sisters, and we should be joining it, right? But one of the songs, the central song, the original song, the, the kind of consuming fire at which our light can be lit, <laughs> the light of our singing can be lit, is God's singing, His song, His delight in His people. So, as long as I've been listening to it, I said it's Psalm 45 by Shane and Shane, right? So, they have this play on the phrase, heart bursting at the seams, and it starts with our hearts bursting in light of the gospel, but then it goes on to God's heart. Listen to the words here, but again, I would encourage you to just listen to it yourself. My heart bursts at its banks, spilling with beauty and goodness. I pour it out as a song to my king, shaping the rivers into words. What grace pours from your lips, so singing to God, what grace pours from your lips, the sound calls the midnight to morning. It turns midnight into morning. The melody turns my winter to spring. I echo it now in my worship. And then he says, your heart burst at the seams, flowing with blood and with water. It was, it was precisely because God was overflowing, bursting at the seams with love for us rebellious sinners that Jesus came and his heart did burst at the seams, flowing with blood and water, a song of love flowing out from the tree, singing for the joy set before me. So he will rejoice over you with gladness. Do you think this song could change your day? <laughs> Do you think this song should change our day? Like our mood, how we're doing? Look, it says he will quiet you by his love. Okay, there's actually some question as to how best to translate this. It could be, he will be silent. Okay, which amazingly would mean that in the words of Alec Motier, kind of venerable Old Testament scholar, such is the Lord's love that it goes beyond even divine words. If, that, if that's what this means, it means he doesn't even have words for his love. He's quiet. Whoa, are you kidding me? It cannot be contained because he rejoices and it cannot be fully described. That's crazy. That's like I wouldn't believe it unless the Bible said it. Now, again, I said there's translation question here. So it's either that or, as the ESV has it, he will quiet you with his love. Either way is wonderful, okay? If the ESV's right, then it's, we're like little kids. We kick and we resist and we argue and we doubt and we throw a tantrum. And what does he do? Like a good father or mother, he pulls us little silly toddlers in close and says, shh. To this little agitated child and he quiets us with his love this is the heart of God we just don't believe this we are so prone to resist this listen to Jeremiah 31 20 again just for the heart of God is Ephraim my dear son is he my darling child or it could be translated my child in whom I delight my heart yearns for him I will surely have mercy on him I mean, do you believe that is the heart of God? This is the song of the Redeemer. And if we listen to this song, I think it's going to change our day. <laughs> I think it's going to change our week. So the day of the Lord has come. It's been inaugurated because of Jesus on the cross. But it hasn't come in its fullness. Right? Not all of this is fully Accomplished At that time, verse 20, actually verse 19, but at the time I will deal with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcast. 
So all the exiled, all the scattered, they're going to be brought home. I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. Again, it's inaugurated. We rebellious children who de deserve rejection and condemnation have been honored to be called beloved sons and daughters. If we're in Christ, there's no condemnation. This is, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. We already have the honor. But one day, that honor is going to be cosmically declared. One day, separation left and right, sheep and goats, if you've taken refuge in Jesus, you are going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. All the enemies completely, like the whole world is washed clean of evil and there's nothing left but fullness of joy forever. Or, depart from me, I never knew you. That is ultimate cosmic shame. This is ultimate cosmic honor. Even if you get marginalized because of your faith, even if you get persecuted and insulted and people just dismiss you because they think you're a religious nut job, oh, one day, <laughs> you are going to be cosmically honored. I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth at that time. At that time, the day of the Lord, I will bring you in. He's already brought us in, but we're not home yet. Inaugurated, but not consummated. At that time, when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when, when I restore your fortunes. We already have the riches of his mercy, but we're still in exile here on our way home to our true home, true possessions. So, <laughs> I was going to read from, see if I can do this really quickly. Narnia, magician's nephew. Um, if you're familiar with this story, there's these little kids and they find some magic rings and they go and they can go between these different worlds and they end up in Narnia on the day it was created. And it's kind of dark at first, but they hear this song and then they realize it's coming from the mouth of this lion and everything just comes alive. The sun rises in the sky and the earth just starts to just flood with life and it's all a result of the song of the lion. And it's a beautiful picture. So you can read The Magician's Nephew and get it firsthand. Um, so just as his song created the cosmos and the birds and octopuses, oh my goodness, my teacher, the octopus, you got to go watch that on Netflix. It's crazy. You'll worship God because of it. Um, sorry, that was not in my notes. Um, the creation is declaring, singing the song, Right? We can see all around us. And because of Jesus, his song is making all things new. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. A new community, new relationships, new desires, new everything. But yet, we still struggle. And one day, the day of the Lord, the full just wiping away of all evil and the full deliverance and restoration of his people is coming. So his song is making all things new. Let's tune our ears to the song of the Redeemer and the song of the redeemed will well up and overflow. And it's going to change our day. <laughs> and some people might just say, what in the world is different about you? Where did you get that hope that is within you? and we can share it with them. So we're going to close with this song, our song, fittingly, from age to age, and then we'll be done. Oh, Lord, tune our hearts to sing your praise, sing of your grace, and tune our ears to hear your song of love and mercy and grace and even delight and joy in your redeemed people. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.